I think some of it, especially now, has to be a little bit more deliberate of identifying those things that you enjoy and finding a way to engage in it, knowing that the chances of playfulness will exist because it is something you already enjoy. I think also uh, if you are open to making mistakes, trying new things can bring you joy, you know, because oftentimes when we try new things, it's not going to be that great or, you know, we're going to make some mistakes, but if we can find, again, I go back to staying in the process. If we can find humor in our mistakes and in trying these things that, that can be very helpful. Um, you, you want to find the people that, that, um, are enjoying life and, and, you know, do things with them, invite them to do things. You're listening to Becoming Wildly Resilient, brought to you by University of Kentucky Human Resources, Health and Wellness. In this series, we'll explore a variety of well-being topics with experts from the university community in physical, emotional, nutritional, and financial health. Join us and together we'll discover how we can thrive at work, home, and beyond. Hey there, listener. So glad you're joining me for another episode of Becoming Wildly Resilient. For those who may be joining for the first time, welcome. I'm your host, Jacob Hester. So when was the last time you felt truly alive, when you were deeply engaged, connected, and focused? You may find that it's been a while. Or even if it wasn't, it may have been difficult to recall. If either of these describe your experience, you're not alone. Some of my colleagues and I recently read a new book from author Catherine Price called The Power of Fun, How to Feel Alive Again. In it, she describes this idea of true fun, which she defines as the magical confluence of playfulness, connection, and flow. She also details why it's essential and how we can bring more fun into our lives. This book really resonated with us as a strategy for supporting ourselves and others. So I've decided to dedicate three episodes to exploring true fun through conversations on playfulness, connection, and flow. The voice you heard at the beginning is Ann Bassoni, a licensed clinical social worker and mental health therapist with HR Work Life. She recently joined me to chat about playfulness and laughter. In this conversation, you'll learn about what true fun is and is not, why focusing on true fun is a way forward for us, how playfulness and laughter are good for our bodies, minds, and relationships, and how humor helps make the workplace feel more human. We also share some personal examples of true fun and playfulness in and out of the workplace, as well as ways you can begin incorporating true fun and playfulness into your days. Before you jump into our conversation, I just want to give you a quick reminder to hit the follow button wherever you may be listening so that you don't miss the remainder of this three-part series or other future episodes. And now, here's my conversation with Anne. Welcome back, Anne. I'm delighted to chat with you again. I'm really happy to be here. Thanks for asking me. For those that don't know you or didn't catch our last interview, can you tell our listeners a little bit about yourself and the work that you do? Sure. Uh, I am a licensed clinical social worker, and I work for the Work-Life Office, offering free and confidential counseling to uh, UK faculty, staff, sponsored dependents, and retirees. And I am um, originally from California, but have been living in Lexington a long, long time. You're one of the original crew of Work-Life, right? Uh, yeah, I was hired to start the the Work Plus Life Connections program uh, 12, 13 years ago, I think. Thir yeah, something like that. Yeah, that's awesome. Um, so we are starting our three-part series today on true fun. And author Catherine Price describes this as like the magical confluence of playfulness, connection, and flow. So can you tell us about a time that you've experienced true fun? No, I can't. I never have fun. <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> um Huh. True fun. Well, I guess, um, uh, boy, there's a lot, not all appropriate for live air, but, um, I, I think of like one, I think that involved work is, uh, when a friend of ours, a cohort, well, a, a peer, uh, had uh, back surgery and we were all helping bring food to her and Terry Weber and I, uh, signed up for a time together and Terry dropped me off in front of the restaurant to get the food. And then she went to park. And when I came out, I thought I saw her car. So I walked over, I opened the door and I was like, why has she filled the seat with all this stuff? And this lady says to me, she said, what are you doing? And my first thought was, oh my gosh, she thinks I'm robbing her. So I said, this is not a holdup. This is not a holdup. 
And she, there was like this moment where we both looked at each other and then we busted out laughing. And then I hear in the distance, Terry saying, Anne, Anne, I'm over here. And I think of that as fun because this, this lady had a little kid in the back seat. And I thought, you know, oh my gosh, that kid's probably like, what is going on? And this woman for a minute thought, you know, is she, is she carjacking me? But it's one of those things that Terry and I will tell together. And we, but we all have our parts, like just at the right moment, she'll say, and then I just hollered out and, and, but then I also think like, what did that lady go home and say? Like, did, did she tell her friends or things like that? But to me, it's fun because it, it continues to make me laugh or to, to think about it. Um, you know, it makes me feel good. So I call those fun moments. I don't know if other people would, but you know, carjacking is not my thing, but you know, <laughs> Yeah, that's a that's a, actually a really great example. I think it's kind of twofold, really. Like in the moment, you had this moment of playfulness and like in a situation that might have been, you know, kind of scary for that person because right. you hopped in the wrong car and you diffuse the situation with playfulness, actually would say like, oh, this is not a this is not a stick up. This is not a hold up. <laughs> then you all have this moment or the two of you all start laughing together, which is that like bonding, that connection piece that mm -hmm. happens. Um, and then like you're really engrossed in that moment in the time. So there's your flow. Um, but that memory also has now served served um, and it's really stuck with you and it's a, a connection piece between you and Terry and, a, and a story you can tell and that banter that you all have telling that story later on is also moments of true fun because you're, you're kind of re-sparking that for you along the way so that's a really that's a really great example um, and there's a reason I asked you on here um, I'm, I'm straight out the gate you said oh, I can't tell you something fun um, <laughs> I knew good and well that you would have a, more than a hundred <laughs> examples um, to give us, I think the two of us are probably two of the the biggest um, pranksters and jokesters in our in our respective offices. I would say, yeah, it's one of the things I miss about remote work is that uh, my coworker Rhonda, she is jumpy. I mean, you know, she's not a nervous person, but I can walk in and I've learned I can startle her. So I'll walk in and sometimes I'll be purposeful. I'll go, Rhonda. You know, she'll jump out of her chair. And other times I walk in and I say, Rhonda, and she still jumps. And like when I, we were talking about things we miss and I think, ah, I miss scaring Rhonda, you know, and, and she's just like, I don't know that I miss that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you ought to. You all mentioned that a little bit on the the past episode that the uh -huh. two you all did together, and you talked about shooting her with a Nerf gun oh <laughs> in gosh, the office. Yes. <laughs> uh, so we've kickstarted this process months ago in our last conversation. But um, I'll share one too. I'll actually go a, kind of a non work example, um, and my mine's like really kind of simplistic. Um, I, as I mentioned on the show before, I have a I have an infant now, and so a lot of my time is devoted to that. Um, in ways that I've like had to try to find fun again um, with the um, sort of minimal amounts of time that I have and refocusing how I think about fun. Um, recently, we have basically what I call music class, um, where like a few days a week, at least we explore like a classic album or like a an artist that I really love or something like that. But uh, recently, like a good example that I did this is like I, I synced up our lights to the music um, and I cranked Tom Petty on and we were just dancing around the living room and I'm singing out loud. Um, and that like for me is that element of like playfulness because I had the lights going and then we're dancing and like we're laughing and all that sort of thing. Um, the connection, obviously, we're building like a bond between the two of us. Right. And like in that moment that there, the flow was there, I'm not thinking about the to-do list that I have or the the ills of the world or anything like that. So um, yeah, it's, it, I, I think you can see kind of between our two examples that like they, it doesn't have to be these huge gestures that we all sort of sometimes think about when we hear the word fun, like a massive vacation mm -hmm. or something like that. So right, right. as a listener, I actually want you to pause, hit, hit pause right now. Um, and think about, well, actually hit pause when I finish this statement, but <laughs> basically think about a time that you had true fun recently. Reflect on it. What were you doing? Who were you with? Where were you? What objects or devices were present, if any? When was the last time? It, was it easy to call that up? Was it difficult? Hit pause and think about it. So now that you've kind of thought about it, I'll talk about true fun a little bit more. So what you may have noticed is that like, this typically is a really active process. Um, it's not like a passive consumption. You you probably weren't recalling like sitting there watching a movie by yourself. Um, you were probably doing something with someone. Um, that's a common scenario when it comes to true fun. Um, you may not have seen the things like 
what Catherine Price calls fake fun, um, which are like the activities or devices or things like that that are marketed to us as fun um, that do often give us some sort of like initial jolt of pleasure, but um, ultimately end up kind of leaving us unfulfilled or feeling bad or something like that. Um, but you may have also noticed that those came in a variety of contexts. So it could have been out in nature. It could have been doing physically active stuff. Um, it could have been music related. It could have been creativity. Um, it could have just been a moment that you shared with someone else where you were bantering back and forth. It could have been in a large group of people. Um, True fun hits introverts and extroverts. We have different ways that we find them, um, but it's really individualized to us. Um, and so that's kind of what I want to explore over these next three episodes, particularly. Um, but we're obviously we're here to talk about playfulness, which is that first piece of true fun. Um, but before we really get into that, let's also kind of talk about the bigger need for true fun, because um, I think it's important to highlight why we're even devoting three episodes to this. Um, so kind of based on your work and your own experience, do you feel like this is something that we're lacking as a society or have maybe lost touch with? Um, as of late? Well, I definitely think uh, that the pandemic has made it in some ways more difficult to have fun because part of, of having fun and, and laughter is the connection that occurs when when we are with people uh, and that can create that that fun and that playfulness. You know, but we've had the pandemic, we've had social unrest, we've had racial injustice, all these things going on at once that really impact people in different and deep ways. And for some people, um, not so much, but I do. I think um, if it's solely based on the number of people that I am seeing because of depression or anxiety, definitely. I mean, people are really struggling and we have seen during the, the early part of the pandemic, when we all thought this was just going to be a short term type of thing, there was some fun in it. I mean, people were having a good time with it and, and they, you know, were enjoying being with one another. And I had people saying, you know, oh, my gosh, we're not rushing around and now we can all sit down and eat and we're having fun. But then it kept going. And, um, you know, and the things that people would often do for for playful things of you know maybe it was getting together with friends or going to the gym or family gatherings things like that became much more harder or didn't happen and so um i think for a lot of people uh there there is that thing of then okay well how do i have fun how am i playful you know because i do think we all turn to devices. Um, people know this about me. I love TikTok. I know it's there's there's problems with it, but some of those videos absolutely crack me up. You know, but I think we all, I mean, myself included, I got used to turning to that, you know, but after a while, you're just like, oh, this is not so much. So I think the heaviness of the world, we need to, um, it's really important to find those moments of playfulness, which to me, um, and I, I think Catherine Price says it too, it's just those those daily things where we find pleasure. That that can be playfulness. And I think we've had to move away from thinking of playfulness as big games or huge gatherings or, um, you know, uh, lavish put togethers. And what do you, where's the playfulness in just the day to day? Like you said, with your boy, you know, you put on this music and you're dancing and, and it's interesting because, you know, laughter is one of the first human sounds babies emit. I mean, they're, they're responding to um, social cues of, of laughing uh, back and forth. That's one of the first things kids do. And then to think that laughter is the first human sound. I mean, that, that speaks to me of the importance of laughter and playfulness. Yeah, definitely. And I think you, I think you touched on some of the things that I think about too, were like the early parts of the pandemic there, because we were thrust into it, there was this opportunity to, to simplify and to reevaluate and to think about things in a different way and to reconnect with ways that we might have been more playful or have found true fun. And like you said, it continued on and on and on and on. <laughs> and it feels like we're never, it's never ending kind of thing. Right. And we lost that energy, that initial spark that we had. And we start replacing it with things like what she describes as like little um, slot machines in our pockets. <laughs> <laughs> because they continue to hook you and keep you coming uh -huh. back. So I think it's important to note that like when we're talking about true fun, we're not thinking about it as like one more thing you have to do, one more thing you have to add into your schedule um, to be healthy. 
or to be happy or whatever. Um, it's really a lot of it boils down to what have we been doing that has replaced this mm. and how can we sort of get back to that as well? Because you've mentioned it with being children, like the first one of the first sounds they really emit is laughter. So it's ingrained in us from this beginning. Um, but I think we start to let a lot of stuff bog us down and we replace the things that we find delight and joy in with things that we think are going to do those things and temporarily do those things sometimes, but don't really do it in the long run. And I think that's kind of the point that we've hit now. And you could hear that in how we've talked about the pandemic and moving forward in these in these episodes as well, how it's changed. The conversation has changed from six or eight months ago to where it is now. Um, and it's like kind of really like fascinating to me to think about how I've thought about it or talked about it or how I've phrased questions in that time too. Um, so, I mean, you kind of touched on it a little bit. Why do you think seeking true fun then is so important right now? Um, what do you see as like the the benefits for seeking it? Well, I think the the benefits are that it it does, it builds that connection. I think that we all as humans have to have, we need that connection to feel healthy, to feel a part of, to feel love, to, to give love. And I think one of the benefits of playfulness is that it, it, you know, it helps our health. It helps our mental health. It helps our emotional health. It helps our spiritual health because this playfulness idea of interacting with others, of finding, you know, joy in the moment in the day, uh, it does take you away from the artificial connection that you get with devices when you are binging on a show or spending hours on on an app um this is true and it's lasting because i mean there's a couple of videos i will think of and i just automatically laugh but i have probably thousands of stories and memories that i have that will just make me smile i mean i can be sitting there really struggling and i get triggered and i think oh my gosh i remember this and i think we need that more than anything now uh because there's some days it seems like there's not a lot to be um, happy about or playful about or or um, that make us feel good. And so it's really important that we we try to get that rather than waiting for it to come to us because it won't always when we're in, you know, in our own homes or things like that sometimes. Yeah, definitely. And I think basically what I'm hearing is like you're, you're creating these memories as well. And like that's happening at like a chemical level in your brain um, and like the synapses that are firing when this mm -hmm. is going on. Um, and that's, that is a, a plus of true fun and playfulness is like it, it helps you wire that into your brain so that you can draw upon that later when you need it. Um, so when we're thinking about something like resilience and facing hard times and how do we come out of them, that's a tool that we can use in that moment right. um, to, to think about a positive time and kind of switch our brains and get ourselves to a, a maybe a calmer place um, or a, a little more joyful place or something like that. Um, something else I think about like as a benefit of of true flowing and, and playfulness would be this is a, a term that really caught on, I think, in the pandemic as well, is languish, which is mm. that like that feeling of like, meh, like you're not <laughs> like you're not burnout necessarily, like you've not completely detached. Um, you're not like in a fully stressed mode all the time necessarily, but you just kind of are very indifferent. Mm -hmm. um, and you just feel like something's kind of off or there's just this like heaviness, um, but you really can't put your finger on it necessarily. And that's kind of what language is. Um, and I think the the benefit of true fun is that it helps us flourish, which mm -hmm. is the opposite of language. Um, and I know like absolutely from my own like experience that language is real. I've definitely been feeling that um, more lately than I did like we mentioned, like at the beginning of the pandemic, when there was some of that um, energy. So that's, I mean, that's a huge way to really get us to start feeling a little more engaged and a little more alive again. Um, and you mentioned like the mental and emotional health benefits and that that's kind of where those drill down into. Um, and the, you know, the social ties and the community and reducing loneliness. Um, you've already mentioned a lot of those. Um, but something interesting that Catherine Price says about it as well is that it, she calls it like a blueprint for happiness because it's shifting our focus from being happy to having fun. Mm -hmm. um, and so, it, again, if we think about 
that like active versus passive um, or thinking of happiness as an end goal when it's not. I mean, right. they're, they're just right. states that you're moving in and out of. Um, you can think about it more as a process and, and you're, you're focused on the task at hand rather than like, am I achieving this? So you don't have that, dis you're not thinking about that disappointment of like, oh, I didn't get happiness today. Right. Oh no, like I failed. And then you start to continue to sort of spiral out too. So those are some of the big things that I think about, like specifically with true fun. Um, but playfulness itself, I mean, you can, like I said, it brings you out of that mundane and there, I mean, there's plenty of research out there on play and how it benefits like our brains and helping us be a little bit smarter or mm -hmm. make better decisions or um, regulate our emotions a little better um, or even protect against things like dementia or heart disease. Um, so it's super powerful. When I was putting together a, um, a PowerPoint, a presentation about laughter, I was really surprised about the heart part because it said that uh, laughter improves the function of blood vessels. So it actually increases the blood flow, which reduces the chance of heart attack or heart failure. And, you know, so you have that going on and then you have all these endorphins that are being released, those feel good chemicals. And, you know, I like how you said you, you're, you're kind of focusing on the process, you know, um, and I, I compare it to like, I like to make jewelry. And if I'm, if I'm working on a project and I'm thinking, boy, when I'm done, people are going to be like, this is so great. This is so beautiful. It's the ugliest piece of jewelry I ever create. But if I just think, oh boy, this is great. I love the way this yellow is sitting on this orange and, you know, and, oh, I really like the way it's bending. I'm, I'm being playful and experiencing some happiness right there. I'm, I'm, I'm in the moment and, and I, I get to carry that then with me. Whereas when we look at the future, those expectations, you know, I, that's what I love about um, AA is one of their, their things for uh, recovering alcoholics is serenity is inversely proportional to our expectations. So the more I expect that this is going to be a great day. I'm going to have happiness today. The more I'm going to be disappointed. So if I just am looking at what's in front of me and what is is coming my way, um, it's hard to get disappointed. Yeah, I mean, I think that's really that's really powerful to think about. Like, it it sounds a little counterintuitive, or it almost sounds like like one of those things. Like, should we be telling people this? Like, <laughs> to, to like to lower their standards? <laughs> but it's not really lowering <laughs> your standards. You know, like you're bringing mindfulness back into it and you're yes. you're taking the future focus out of it a little bit um, and really just focusing and concentrating on what's in front of you rather than the next thing so that you don't miss the thing that's in front of you. Right. And I think yes. that's what happens to us with our phones a lot of times too, is we look to it to, to fulfill this thing that we want to fulfill, but it's really not kind of doing that for us. We're just quickly scrolling on to the next one and the next one, and the next one. And we're not engaging in even the post that we're looking at right then. We're right. thinking about the next post. And uh -huh. so like in a, in a micro example, that's what's happening and, and why it's kind of so dangerous um, or uh, dangerous, probably maybe a, a little harsh there. But um, why it why it kind of hoaxes so badly, too, um, is it like social media is not inherently bad. Phones are not inherently bad. No. Some of these things can facilitate playfulness and can facilitate true fun. Um, but it's all about how we use them um, and how we like where our focus and where our attention is um, rather than like, again, just like I said, passively, mm -hmm. passively scrolling by, not, not locking into the thing that's in front of you and just thinking about what's coming after that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. So how would you how would you define playfulness then as one of like the core elements of true fun? I almost I, I almost think of of playfulness as uh, the front door, because if if we can find some sense of pleasure in what's in front of us, in in what we're doing, um, it opens up just this, you know, again, the release of endorphins, feeling good. You know, we're we're not so worried about being by ourselves or not being able to see family or not being able to go to our favorite restaurant or whatever. But if we're with others, once we start finding that pleasure in the the day to day things, it leads to a connection. I mean, I love those moments where you see groups and maybe. One person starts to giggle and then another person joins in. And then pretty soon this person over here is laughing and somebody said, might say, well, what's so funny? And somebody's like, I have no idea. I don't know. I just know that, you know, this laughter is, is creating this sense in me that I want to laugh. And so then when that happens, 
I almost think that's the living room. And then you get to the kitchen where in, in my world is the, the heart of things, you know, where, where everybody comes together, you get that, that flow where everybody's engaged. Everybody is enjoying themselves. Everybody is, um, is forgetting, like you said, forgetting about the pressures, forgetting about, um, the, that we can't uh, go out and do things with people or whatever it might be to some degree. I mean, there's some greater issues that I don't know that we all ever forget about totally, but it allows us to be one with everybody else. And that sense then of belonging and being a part of, to me is the, the almost the end result of playfulness um, because it, it, it's, it's that front door to the rest of what we can experience. Because if I walk into something and I am feeling really down, or I just, I'm looking around and all I see is the negative, I'm going to miss out on a lot of those simple things. Like, um, sometimes uh, I remember once I went to a doctor and I was really nervous about going and we were walking down this long hall. It just kept going. And I, I was getting more nervous. And all of a sudden I thought, what if this hallway was a trampoline and we could just jump and turn flips? And I don't know where that came from, but it helped me be in the moment and be like, this is okay. I can, you know, whatever is happening, this is okay. And so I, I just, I think it opens up our, our well-being to, to other resources, I guess. Yeah, that that sparked an idea with me. And I think about like public speaking and and that like old adage of like picturing your audience <laughs> naked. Right. Like both of those are like, they're playful ideas that you're incorporating at the time to help mm-hmm. you get through what is like a stressful situation. So it's, I mean, that's a, a, a tool for resilience, mm-hmm. um, really. And something else you, you were talking about that I think is really interesting is how it how it strengthens relationships, um, because you you mentioned the sort of the positive and like laughter and how that's contagious. But the negativity is also contagious. Mm-hmm. And what's what's really interesting is how like when it's playfulness and laughter, that strength is very, very strong. Um, and you really cement those memories and that connection in your brain. But you can also bond through negativity. But what ends up happening is that is so fragile. So you may think that you're having a great connection with with your coworkers when you're commiserating together. And you may kind of get into that cycle where um, it's a complaint. You're always having complaining sessions rather than having sessions of like playfulness. Mm-hmm. Um, and those those connections become really fragile and it can start to fracture really quickly. And then that negativity busts wide open um, mm-hmm. rather than like really continuing to cement those playful moments together and really having a strong bond together. Obviously, you're not going to always have playfulness there. You can't always use it. But that is one of the benefits of it as well um, when it comes to like our relationships and how it how it helps build connection. Um, but like from a kind of a definition standpoint, what Catherine Price calls it or how she defines it is that it's a spirit of lightheartedness and freedom of doing an activity just for the sake of doing it, not really caring about the outcome. So in other words, it's a moment where we're carefree. We smile. We laugh. Um, we're a little less self-conscious. And I think that definition is important as well, because if you think about play and the words that might've come up in your head when you first heard it, is that like, we think about it as this like transitive verb. So to Mm. play a game or to play a sport. And so, I I mean, this is taking it out into a much broader context so that like the activity really doesn't matter, so to speak. Like you can bring playfulness to any activity. You're walking down the hall and you manage to bring playfulness into it. It's not something that you're doing for fun. Mm -hmm. Um, Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, so it's really about the mindset that we bring and it's about a playful mindset and trying to find those moments where we can insert playfulness so that we can have better connections so we can maybe get to a state of flow or hopefully we can get all three of those to pop up together and we have a moment of true fun that we can then call back on to later on in our lives um, and really find a great memory for ourselves too. I agree. I agree. I mean, I, I think you know, some of those, those memories that, that we have that we can uh, recall and it's still, uh, we still feel playful about it, or we still, it still brings up a good feeling. Those, those are important. I mean, I can remember some, some low points or some bad points, but, you know, if I flip through my memories, a lot of them are going to be about those playful moments, about those, those feelings where we connected. And I I read something that was called like, um, 
uh, playful dominoes. Like, you know, once you, you start that, that playfulness and it builds a good feeling and people pick up on it, it just all starts rolling around and it's something you get to keep with you. A good visual example of of how this works too, because <laughs> dominoes are inherently sort of a playful object as well. Yes. <laughs> so I, I love that as it kind of brings it together in a nice way and, and something you can really visualize too. Um, so what about it work? Like, first off, why is it, why does it become such this taboo type of thing that we think about that like, I cannot be playful at work. It is not allowed. Um, we're coming, we're HR people. <laughs> I think we're the ones that, that I think people tend to think about when they're like, I shouldn't be being playful at work, but <laughs> like, why did, why does that happen? And then why is it actually useful instead? Yeah. Uh, and it's something I've never understood because I love humor. I love playfulness. I think it just, it makes the day go by. And I think in our office, uh, it is encouraged. I, you know, I think we deal with heavy things, we are talking to people that are really troubled or um, having a difficult time. And, and I think part of it is knowing when to use it versus when not to, um, because you can really have some ill time things and you can tell when somebody's trying to be funny and it just falls flat and everybody's like, Oh, and so I think that's where we think about the playfulness is that, are you going to time it right? Is it going to be appropriate? And I think this is a hard question for me to answer because I think it's essential. I mean, in my book, playfulness is, is essential to having a office that works together, that feels like a, a together unit that wants to support and help one another. Um, but I think it kind of goes with our overall feeling at work of that drives me nuts of you can't make mistakes. You have to be serious. We have to get this stuff done. And I wish we could move to something where if you made a mistake, that's okay. Let's learn from it. Let's, let's use that opportunity. And I could see playfulness being a part of that when you make a mistake in learning. Um, but I think it also is that we have this idea of playfulness as being really childlike sometimes. And I think that's where our mind goes when we think about playfulness is just um, inappropriate, not the right time. Um, we have more serious things to think about where I think that playfulness opens it up for all of that, really. Yeah, absolutely. I, I think about here's my here's my one of two pop culture references I'm about to drop. Um, which right. is, it's obviously if you've been listening to the podcast, you know that I love to sneak them in wherever I can. Uh -huh. So that like inappropriateness or ill timed joke um, or really just going too far. Uh -huh. Michael Scott from The Office oh, is yes. is absolutely yes. the best <laughs> definition or like visualization that you can have for like. Yes playfulness and humor going wrong in the workplace. There are so right. many cringe moments that like, I, I remember having a, a class on humor in high school and it was like, we find things funny because we envision ourselves being in that position. Uh -huh. And so like, that's why Michael Scott is funny to us as a character, because we can envision ourselves being there and like, Oh, that like cringe right. moment that you have, like you kind of put yourself a little bit in his shoes, but also in like the rest of the office. And you're like, you can laugh at it, but there's still times even in that show. And I mean, I've heard, I've heard interviews about this of like the Scott's tots where it's like, that was such a cringe moment that like, it wasn't even funny anymore. There were so many moments where he did something cringy that was still funny. Uh -huh. He like goes so far, even in that episode that like people look back and it's like <laughs> one of the lowest rated episodes that they had <laughs> because it was just so cringe. And I think it's a great example of like, this, don't don't be a Michael Scott, <laughs> yeah. <Right>. <laughs> or maybe a little more like a gym, like where you're, where you are still having kind of some playful banter, but you get things done, um, and uh -huh. you don't necessarily really cross the line. Uh, my second my second reference here, um, and and I'll kind of preface it first with uh, with how it's helpful in the workplace. Um, we we've, we've talked about being like more kind of engaged or more focused, um, but creativity is sparked this way mm. as well. Um, and it increases our motivation. Um, if you're enjoying what you're doing and you're having fun coming to work, you're going to be more motivated inherently. Um, so those, those are really helpful. And so that's where this, this next reference comes from, which is Mary Poppins. Um, so if you think of Spoonful of Sugar, it opens up with, in every job that must be done, there is an element of fun. You find the fun and snap the job's a game, and every task you undertake becomes a piece of cake. A lark, a spree. It's very clear to see that a spoonful of sugar makes the medicine go down. I love that. <laughs> Literally in the first verse of that song is 
I think in a nutshell, why playfulness and humor are important in the workplace. They actually help us get from point A to point B yes. and enjoy it in the process. And we are a little more innovative. We are a little more creative. Um, we connect a lot more. And those things are rooted in our well-being. Those are critical to our well-being. Mm -hmm. um, so when we think about it being childlike, that's that kind of initial reaction of like, I shouldn't be doing this. But right. as long as you're not a, as long as you're not pulling a Michael Scott, <laughs> it is it's beneficial. It's helpful. It's something that we should be encouraging more in the right spaces and setting those spaces up a little bit more when we have those opportunities as well. Yeah, I think about when when you said that about brainstorming sessions, when it's just you're you're rifting off each other. You know, somebody says this and it makes you think of this. And and pretty soon your ideas are all over the place. But within there, there's a nugget of something that's useful. And, and you know, I think for like Rhonda and Eric and I, when we're trying to put programs together and we're doing that and we're we're kind of rifting off each other and one idea creates another, I think that we come together and we find something that that works, that feels good, that we think, boy, this is going to be a good program. This is going to be something that people really enjoy. Yeah, absolutely. I think the there's a principle in improv called the yes and. Yeah. Um, and so that's like something that that they teach you in an improv class that you don't you don't come with the like the the no but. Right. Because <laughs> if you go no but you shut it down right there. Yeah. there. The creativity is gone. There's nowhere else for that to go. You've fundamentally shut it down and you're changing direction completely. But if you go with that yes and, you leave it open and that's where that creativity and that's where you can have that banter and that riffing back and forth to come to a common place too. So that mm -hmm. the first idea we know not always is the best idea. Mm -hmm. And so you can continue to to say yes and and you build on that and you build on that and you can use playfulness and humor to help get to that point, too. Mm -hmm. um, so, again, yeah, I think that's a, a really great example of of how we can use it and why it is beneficial in the workplace. So I, I think it's interesting, too, that we, we've talked about laughter a few times already in the book. She also mentions that, like, when she did her survey for this book to define true fun and to hone in on these three pieces 90 percent of the people that she surveyed mentioned laughter in their descriptions of true fun mm -hmm. um, so you touched on it a little bit can you go maybe a little bit more into detail and in why laughter is so important to our short and long-term physical and mental health laughter is, is is contagious i think that's the big thing is like i said sometimes you'll start laughing and you don't even know why other people are laughing you just are and I think laughter also makes certain situations, whether they might be embarrassing or difficult, a little bit more tolerable. Uh, you know, I think that's partly why we laugh when we see somebody fall or um, they slip and, and we start laughing. Um, and it's universal. I mean, I go back to thinking about this is the first human sound that babies emit. And I just think it's in us, It, you know, and, and, the the physical thing i mean it lowers blood pressure it prevents some illnesses or, or staves off some to some degree um even laughter kind of because of it it releases the endorphins you get that that feel good and it, it's almost like a natural painkiller at times too so i think when you look at all that i mean there's a lot of well-being that comes from it physically and emotionally it's just that we don't even um playing it that way. It's just, uh, that's what our body does. You know, this amazing body we have, that's what it does with laughter. I think something else that's beneficial about laughter beyond just like kind of the, the well-being realm is it also helps us differentiate between what true fun is and something that we enjoy. Mm. And Cause I think that's a good distinction about true fun that I want to make that like most scenarios of true fun have laughter in them. They have connection in them in some way. And we'll talk about that in the next episode. They have flow in them in some way. But if you're thinking about like, what well, is fun to me? Your first reaction might be those things of enjoyment. Mm -hmm. So like you can sit down and read a book and enjoy it. Mm -hmm. But are you laughing during that book? Are you are you connected to someone or something when you're reading that book? Do you do you find yourself in flow? So you may, like I said, reading is a good example. You could end up a little bit of connection, connecting with the characters possibly, um, or maybe some discussion that you have afterwards. But 
get, you get in a flow. I mean, you really are in, engrossed in that book in the time. But is there that element of playfulness in there? Um, so again, it's very, very subjective. So what is true fun for me or what is playful for me might not be for you. Exactly. Um, and so it's how we think about these three different pieces. Um, and that's where laughter comes into play. Um, that if laughter is involved, there's a much better chance that it's going to be true fun as well. Um, because you know that that element of playfulness is also there when you're laughing. That's true. Yeah. I, I hadn't really thought of it that way, but, but it is. And, and I think about those times in my life that have been the darkest, I'm not laughing. I mean, I, I think at one of my darkest moments, I think that was the one thing that that really kind of shook me was I thought, when was the last time I laughed? You know, and I, I, I couldn't think of it. And I knew I was miserable. I knew I was not um, having a lot of pleasure or enjoyment. Um, and, and so I think as I've become more healthy, I mean, that's an indicator to me. You know, am I laughing? Have I laughed today? Because I, I will find something to laugh at every day because I just think it it leads to that well-being. And, you know, there's the laughter that is that true from the gut, mm -hmm. almost want to, you know, wet your pants laughter that I love that takes your breath away. And and then there's that laughter where people go, huh, and you think, boy, there, there's no joy there. there, you know? And so I think even the tone of our laughter, the, the, the um, quality of it is also an indicator of how much fun or pleasure we're getting out of the situation. So how do we balance humor with the seriousness of life or in the workplace? Well, I think for some of that, you have to take some social cues. You know, I mean, I, I, um, I, I've had this said to me a lot of you play too much. And my response is usually, well, you don't play enough, you know, but I have had to because there I think there's just moments where you 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 have to be aware of of how everybody else is doing and if you keep cracking jokes and people are being very serious that's a time where you, hopefully you think okay rein it in let's let's be serious let's get stuff done um you know and i don't know that there's a um if if we could write out a prescription for you can have fun at this point you can find pleasure at this point at work but at this point you stop I really do think you take the keys from people around you, uh, and and what what's the what's the temperature? You know, I, I'm I have said inappropriate things when in moments where I should have just shut up, you know, and and I learn from that. It's like okay, this this is a good indicator, but that's a I, I I think that's a hard question for me to to answer about what's that line? Where does it where, where how do you define that? I'm not really sure about that. Maybe rethinking this question, how. Like, what do we do when that happens? And when we do cross the line, if we are trying to incorporate more playfulness, because we know it is something that's not frivolous. Um, so maybe we do take a chance and we we cross the line accidentally. Like, Obviously, it was not a, an intentional thing. Um, it, it's, again, kind of on a micro level of Michael Scott, like where we we think <laughs> something's going to be funny and it's not. Um, and it, again, on the screen, it's funny, but in reality, it's, right. it's not funny. Like it's, mm -hmm. it, it wasn't a good joke. It wasn't appropriate. It was not the right place or time or what have you. What do we do when that happens when it's an honest mistake, particularly? I think it's like most things. If you make a mistake, you own it and you apologize. You know, I, I was trying to lighten the mood. I'm, I'm really, I apologize for, um, saying, speaking out of turn or, or something like that. I mean, I, I will respect you more if you say, well, bad choice of words. I, I, I shouldn't have done that. than if you just kind of slink away and act like it didn't happen, you know, so there's always room for that because the intention most of the time is to lighten the mood or to make things better. And I think if we can look at the intent rather than how it <laughs> just bombed that, that helps in my opinion. And I think that's really important in owning our mistakes um, mm -hmm. and I mean, you hear it like basically you're talking about reading the room and using connection and understanding what may or may not be funny to other people. Is this the right time? And you're using awareness to get to that point as well. So, I mean, it, again, it brings back in mindfulness. It brings back in connection and how these come together um, to help us create true fun and help us, you know, again, be creative and, and have joy in what we do and that sort of thing. So how do we actually then incorporate more playfulness and laughter into our lives in a positive way? I think 
some of it, especially now, has to be a little bit more deliberate of identifying those things that you enjoy and finding a way to engage in it, knowing that the chances of playfulness will exist because it is something you already enjoy. I think also, uh, if you are open to making mistakes, trying new things can bring you joy, you know, because oftentimes when we try new things, it's not going to be that great, or, you know, we're going to make some mistakes, but if we can find, again, I go back to staying in the process. If we can find humor in our mistakes and in trying these things, that, that can be very helpful. Um, you, you want to find the people that, that, um, are enjoying life and, and, you know, do things with them, invite them to do things. But, you know, I think one thing for me is that, um, you know, I am funny, but I'm not funny all the time. I mean, there are times where uh, I'm a grouch and I'm grumpy and I don't feel like being funny or playful. And, and I think you have to respect that too, but I do think it's a little bit more deliberate right now because of how, how, how we're all set up because, you know, when, we go to the grocery store. Um, we, it might be, we just run into something that gives us pleasure or, you know, like I went to, to Kroger once and they were having a sale on sugar and this lady was just packing it into her cart. And I could have walked by, but I was just like, huh, got a sweet tooth. And we started talking <laughs> and all of a sudden she was sharing like her mom's jelly recipe with me. And that's what she was doing. And it was a great price. And I walked away and I felt good. I, I you know, just because I, I took that moment and we don't get that opportunity as much right now. And plus our masks are on. So we don't always get to see the expressions that invite um, reciprocal, you know, conversation you know, and, and it's not as easy on zoom and things like that to, to have fun though. It's definitely possible. It's just a little bit harder. So I, again, I go back to the word deliberate, I think. Yeah. How I would succinctly wrap up what I want to get out of these three conversations is that fun needs work Mm. and work needs fun. Yes. I could not boil it down into any less words. And so that's that's this core element for me is that fun needs work. It it's deliberate. It's going to take some effort because as a kid, it was easy. (laughs) Came to most of us pretty easily as an adult. World's beating us down a little bit. The societal expectations and taboos and those types of things come into play a little bit. So it becomes a lot more difficult as we get older. Tack on the pandemic, tack on being separate from each other. We're in like a perfect storm of like, we've forgotten how to have fun or how to be more playful or and those types of things. So what I really like about her book as well is that she gives kind of like a roadmap for for fun too. And I'll probably talk about these in each of the episodes, but um, she uses the acronym SPARK. And so the S is for making space. Um, so we talked about that at the beginning about like, it's it's not another thing to do on your to-do list. You're looking at your the things that you value and the things that you want to do, and you're replacing it um, because we know your lives are busy. We're not telling you, like, you have to have fun all the time, and you have to add it into all the other responsibilities mm-hmm. that you have. Um, it's really, again, our lives are, are basically what we're paying attention to. I think that was a quote I remember reading in the book. Um, so if attention is our resource, we have to use it wisely. Um, because it's finite. So you're making space for that fun. Um, and you're doing that through also pursuing passions. So that's the P. Um, so those passions, those interests, those hobbies, those things that do bring you delight, you're seeking those out. Um, and you're tapping back into ones that you might have used to have enjoyed. Um, or you like you said, you're trying new things, and you're taking a chance to see if there is something new. Like two weeks ago, I bought a ukulele. I've Played guitar growing up. I hadn't really played it much in quite a while. I was like, I need something new. I need something that's a little more fun. So I went and spent a few dollars on a ukulele. I got a a really basic, like entry level model, just something that I could strum around on. And it's an inherently happy instrument. (laughs) So (laughs) I've seen that and felt that lift um, to have something to focus on or something that I can like turn around and like my break time. Um, now becomes strumming on the ukulele for a few minutes. Um, and so it's, it's something new. It's a new, it's a passion and interest that I'm pursuing. Um, you've mentioned this one as well. So the A is attracting fun. So that's putting yourself around people um, or in situations 
um, or really just trying to get yourself in that fun mindset to attract these things toward you um, rather than like get again, it's kind of putting yourself in your phone and and hoping that fun shows up. Mm-hmm. We're kind of seeing that fun doesn't just show up all right. the time. It can. It can spontaneously mm-hmm. happen. But we can also put the work into having it show up more frequently as well. The R is to rebel. And that's against things like convention or tradition or beliefs or formality or adulthood or expectations or responsibilities, obligations, all those types of things. It's a really broad term. Um, and again, this is where it takes a little bit of tact, I think, um, mm-hmm. in reading the room that like, you're not rebelling for the sake of rebelling necessarily. Right. Um, you're, you're using it in a positive way um, to like get yourself maybe out of this element that you think you were in. Um, and again, that's kind of getting us back to maybe our core selves mm. as well. Um, and then the K, the final one, keep at it. It's not easy. Right. We, we know that, especially if we've lost sight of it, but it kind of becomes like riding a bike as you continue to do it. So you keep plugging away at it, keep working on the S, the P, the A, and the R. Definitely. So that you can, again, attract more fun around you. Um, and you, you put yourself in situations where you're going to have playful connected flow more frequently than if you were passively sitting by and hoping that it shows up. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Good points. Yeah. So besides Catherine Price's book, the power of fun, what other resources do you recommend for people to dive deeper into the benefits of fun play or laughter? Well, I think it's, it's, um, like you said, I mean, try some new things. And, and and that can be along the lines of things that bring you pleasure, but it's a, a different thing within that realm. You can try it. Um, I am one that I like to read um, comics. I like to read um, funny things, you know, things like that. So find, you know, find those type of things. And I guess the other part is even though right now that, that, you know, we're still somewhat um, having to quarantine, be, be on our own when you're out, keep your head up. I mean, look around you because I, I mean, when, when I was walking to and from work um, and, and, you know, there were some days I did, my head was down. I was just like, just get home. But on the days that I looked around, I always found something I hadn't seen before, you know, and, and my mind would just do weird things. Like I bet, you know, if uh, we built a ladder, that would make a great tree house. So keep your, keep aware. I guess that's the thing is, is be aware of what's around you and think about, I mean, to me, when I see different situations, sometimes I have to say, yeah, it's serious, but is it the end of the world? Or is there some bit of humor or laughter or playfulness within this situation that I can take with me? Yeah. It's kind of less about specific books or specific resources. And it's finding the things that are there in front of you because we lose sight of it for sure. Mm -hmm. All right. So we have our wildly resilient playlist. You got to contribute to it (laughs) um, back in our previous episode. Um, So I'm going to give it, since we've already contributed before, I'm going to, we're going to have a little twist on it today. So I'm going to have you give me a song that kind of brings about a sense of like fun or playfulness or humor for you. Okay. Um, I'm going to, of course, I have to go with my Grateful Dead and that would be China Cat Sunflower. I love that song. I love the, the beat of it, just everything about it. You know, those opening notes, I'm like, oh, here we go. This is going to be good. And then because it brings back a memory for me, um, there's two songs and that would be Cindy Lauper's Girls Just Want to Have Fun, uh, because I think that was my, uh, senior year of high school. That, that that was a big song. And boy, we lived that. I mean, we just, we would hear it and we'd all start giggling and having fun. It was like the background music to all sorts of things we did. So that one just is, is there. And then also Bob Marley's um, Three Little Birds. I, those those two are, are full of memory and thus just hearing them. I feel good. I feel that pleasure. Yeah. Three Little Birds almost made it onto my original list as well. Uh, what about yours? I'm, yeah, I'm actually, I'm going to, I'm going to contribute again. Um, I haven't, haven't contributed in a while. So um, I'm going to go with Can't Stop the Feeling by Justin Timberlake from, ah, from the okay. Trolls movie. I've not seen the movie, but that song is like, that's like the epitome of true fun I didn't know for it was me. a Trolls movie song. Yeah, I think it was from the Trolls movie. Okay. Um, but if you go and listen to the lyrics, very much connected to true fun. So they're, they're, 
he talks about elements of playfulness, connection, and flow within that song. So I think it's a really good okay. um, encompassing song, not only lyrically, um, but just the the like beat and the sort of overall vibe of that song is perfect. That's one of those that like you put it on, there's a, probably a nine out of 10 chance I'm going to start dancing no matter where I am. Uh, you're going to see me, yeah, moving around a little bit. <laughs> right. so. Yeah, I couldn't go with another Grateful Dead one. We'll have our own separate <laughs> Grateful Dead playlist for the two of us. But yeah, that's fun. I'll, I'll add um, the Cindy Lauper and Bob Marley on there as well. <laughs> All right. All right. So the last word, what's the one thing you hope listeners take away from our conversation? I think, I, I guess it would be that that fun and, and playfulness are always available to us in, in some way, shape or fashion. And I think like we've emphasized, it's not always obvious, but it, it is finding that that joy in those, what did she say, the mundane day-to-day things. How can you make it fun? How can you take it from, you know, oh, I'm washing dishes to, oh, I'm, I'm cleaning spaceships and I'm drying them for my next adventure. Try to, to do that. And I know it's not easy, but, you know, put the effort there because it's just like, sometimes when we're depressed, waiting to feel like doing something, it's not going to happen unless we take a small step. So, you know, try it out, try, try looking for it and see what happens. Yep. Those small steps start the first domino. Yep. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you so much for coming back on the show and talking about thank playfulness. You. It's always good to talk yeah, to you. <laughs> as always, it's always fun talking to you. I knew you'd be the perfect guest to talk about playfulness. Um, yeah. And I, I look forward to maybe our next conversation down the road. Excellent. I'll be waiting. <laughs> That'll do it for this first episode in our three-part series on true fun. In the next episode, which will release in April, I'll continue the conversation with a new guest and we'll be diving into connection. Until then, I encourage you to take some time over the next few weeks to identify those moments of and opportunities for playfulness that are already occurring around you and then lean into them. And if you want to further explore playfulness, connection, and flow in your life, HR Health and Wellness and HR Work Life will be teaming up to offer online and in-person experiences from May 9th through the 27th to help you rediscover your spark. So be on the lookout for more information soon. As always, you'll find links in the show notes to anything we mentioned in the episode. I also invite you to check out the HR calendar where you can browse any upcoming work life and well-being events from University of Kentucky Human Resources. Until next time, take care of yourself and others and stay well. Thanks for listening to Becoming Wildly Resilient, a podcast series from University of Kentucky Human Resources, Health and Wellness. The UK HR Health and Wellness team, consisting of certified health coaches, fitness experts, registered dietitians, and wellness specialists, offer a wide range of online and in-person programming to University of Kentucky employees, retirees, and their spouses. If you enjoyed this episode, you can listen and subscribe to future episodes wherever you find your podcasts. Connect with us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram by searching at UKY Wellness. There, you'll find links to episode show notes and more. You can also email healthandwellness at uky.edu with any questions or suggestions for future episode topics. To learn more about well-being benefits offered by University of Kentucky Human Resources, visit www.uky.edu slash hr slash well-being. Live well. <laughs>